my pleasure now to introduce our luncheon speaker, Mr. Steve Malloy. He is the founder and publisher of JunkScience.com and a prolific author on such themes as healthcare scams, uh, EPA cleanup standards, the nuclear power industry. Mr. Malloy is a biostatistician with degrees from Johns Hopkins. He's also an attorney with degrees from Georgetown and the University of Baltimore. He has concurrent positions at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the Center for Security Policy, and the American Tradition Institute. He's appeared frequently in print in venues such as the Wall Street Journal and Investors Business Daily, and in person as a commentator on Fox News. He's the author of five well-received books, including his most recent, Green Hell, How Environmentalists Plan to Control Your Life and What You Can Do to Stop Them. Uh, as the many writers present here know, authors are not always responsible for the titles of their books. Editors and publicists have a hand as well, so I'm not quite sure whether the all-out frontal assault on environmentalists in the title of Steve's book was his idea, but it might well be. Steve is a pull-no-punches guy when it comes to the frantic efforts of some environmentalists to invent what they cannot know, to extrapolate beyond the bounds of reason, and to sow fear based on imaginary dangers, and to abuse the good name of science. I will let him demonstrate all of that in his own inimitable style in a few minutes, but before I unleash Steve, I want to present a context for why I've asked him here today. Environmentalism is a relatively new topic for the National Association of Scholars. There's no mention of it in the early volumes of academic questions in the 1980s, and only a few passing glances in the 1990s. The topic simply was not in focus for the NAS as a source of significant campus mischief comparable to racial preferences, multiculturalism, academic feminism, efforts to dismantle the core curriculum, hostility to Western civilization, the politicization of science, and so on. Wait a minute. The politicization of science? Yes, that was a long-standing area of inquiry for the NAS, but somehow NAS failed to register the growing affinity between political activists and environmental alarms. That changed in October 2007 when the NAS bumped into the University of Delaware's dorm-based indoctrination program, which forced hardcore leftist ideology on students and sent those who resisted to what the university itself called the treatment. The Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, did a splendid job in shaming the University of Delaware into dropping that program, temporarily it appears, while the NAS worked behind the scenes. As the dust settled, Adam Kissel, who was then at FIRE and who's here today, pointed out an oddity to me. The Delaware program, which focused mainly on race and sexuality, and had very little to do with environmentalism, was, according to its internal documents, a sustainability program. Now, to the extent that word meant anything at all to me, it meant this was warmed over environmentalism, but I was wrong. We wondered why it was called that and began to tug on that thread. We soon discovered that the word sustainability was a term of much broader scope than it sounded. To its main proponents, the word designated a combination of anti-free market economics, a collective struggle for a social justice agenda, and an anti-fossil fuel environmental agenda, frequently pictured as three circles overlapping and sustainability is at the center of the overlap. This isn't the place to expatiate free over how all of this applies to higher education, but NAS began what was and continues to be the only systematic effort among higher education watchdogs to track what the sustainability movement is up to. For a while, we called it, how many Delawares? We devoted a special issue of academic questions on the movement 
we created an online encyclopedia, adopted a formal policy statement, and published well over 100 articles on our website and elsewhere about the movement. The topic inevitably fronts on the debate over global warming, and here comes a disclaimer. The National Association of Scholars is not positioned to weigh in on the substance of scientific disputes, and we have members on both sides of that debate. When it comes to the science of global warming, we are resolutely in favor of good science, transparency of methods, open access to data, and a peer review process kept free of skullduggery and intimidation. The existence, consequences, causes, possible remediations of global warming aren't our subject, but the misuse of science to advance a political agenda, any political agenda, is very much our concern. One last prefatory remark, and I will turn this over to Steve. Steve is here as a white knight. In our original planning, I intended this luncheon to feature a debate between myself and a leading advocate of the sustainability movement in higher education. Over the months, I contacted all the sustain giants of the land, one by one. Not one of them would accept an invitation to debate their agenda. Some, no doubt, really were busy, but it bears mention that one of the tactics of the sustainability movement is its insistence that we are long past the point where there's anything left to debate. The science is settled. Catastrophe is imminent. The time for critical reflection is past. The time for action is upon us. Dissent from any of these declarations is worse than intellectual folly. It is a kind of treason. That train of thought, the, might we call it the sequestering of reasoned inquiry and the shunning of evidence that doesn't fit the narrative is the signature of a dangerous ideology. It is why the National Association of Scholars has taken up this issue and why we will stick with it. And here to explain how the movement has planted itself in the groves of academe, or as he puts it, sustainability in the college petri dish, is Steve Malloy. Thank you. So good afternoon. It's a great honor to be here today. I want to thank uh, Ashley Thorne for remembering me uh, from a couple years ago when I met her, Peter and the National Association Scholars for inviting me to speak. It takes a certain amount of courage for a group that calls itself the National Association of Scholars to invite a guy from a website called junkscience.com to be the luncheon keynote on his 25th anniversary. Peter asked me to talk about sustain the sustainable sustainability movement on college campuses. Before I do that, I feel that it's incumbent upon me to explain what might qualify the possibly scandalous junk science guy to pontificate on the seemingly very serious topic of sustainability. So who is Steve Malloy and why am I here instead of, say, Al Gore? Well, in, in the spirit of the National Association of Scholars, I have actually spent a great deal of time in school myself. Uh, by the time I was 30, which was many moons ago, I had a graduate degree in biostatistics, a law degree, and a graduate law degree. I had worked as a computer systems engineer for Beltway Bandit firms and for Wall Street firms. Um, then I worked as a lawyer for the Securities and Exchange Commission and then for another investment firm. So far, you're probably not seeing the connection between me and the environment. And until I was 31, there wasn't one. But I made up for lost time. So when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990 and the stock market tanked, I lost my job in the investment business for the second time. Desperate to find a new job in a tough economy, I got hired by a Washington, D.C. lobbying firm. Incidentally, uh, the firm was run by the man who advised Ronald Reagan, for budgetary purposes, to classify ketchup as a vegetable in the school lunch program. <laughs> now, while, while that sounds silly, my boss was as near to being a genius as anyone I've ever met. He knew how the government worked, how it should work. He knew where the bodies were buried. And I think on occasion he actually made some, he actually buried some. Anyway, he hired me because as a lawyer and a biostatistician, <clears throat> he felt I had a good skill set that he thought would be useful in the then up and coming field of environmental risk assessment. My lack of knowledge about the environment or politics was apparently not a problem. Um, and as I've learned over the past 20 plus years, hardly anyone knows anything about the environment. So I got really lucky. I was immediately thrust into assignments that dealt with a broad spectrum of prominent issues, 
uh, pesticides, radiation, toxic waste sites, secondhand smoke, EPA, FDA, food and workplace health regulations. I worked on a project to get George H.W. Bush to issue an executive order to tell agencies like the EPA how to evaluate risks to human health and the environment. I actually became so uniquely knowledgeable about environmental risk assessment that after about three years, I successfully pitched the U.S. Department of Energy to hire me as a consultant to help them fight the EPA. Now, why would the Department of Energy hire an outsider to fight a sister agency? Well, at the time, the EPA was pressing the Department of Energy on cleanups for its chain of weapons laboratories like uh, Oak Ridge, Sandia National Lab, Hanford, and others. The EPA also wanted the, the Department of Energy literally to vacuum its Nevada test site, which is a remote desert area where nuclear weapons were tested. The EPA wanted the Department of Energy to vacuum up the top one inch of soil, decontaminate it, and replace it over this vast area. This work was projected to cost hundreds of billions of dollars 20 years ago, when $100 billion was real money. So my project was to review U.S. government environmental policies and determine whether they had been developed on the basis of science or politics. So this was great for me. It was like a postdoc year, except better. I hired a staff and spent the next year studying environmental policies from A to Z. We interviewed hundreds of people in industry, academia, government agencies, environmental activist groups, really trying to get to the nut of whether environmental policy is based on science or politics. In the end, we produced what I thought was a fantastic report which concluded that environmental policies across the board are based more on politics than science. So I sent my report up the chain of command at the DOE for review so we could get it published. I was very excited and very proud. And then everything came to a screeching halt. I was called to a meeting with a senior Department of Energy political appointee who in no uncertain terms told me that my report would not be seeing the light of day, with the implied threat being that if I knew it was good for my future government contracting business, I would just follow orders. There was no specific criticism of my report that was relayed to me. I was just told to put a lid on it. But even though I was a political novice at the time, it was easy to figure out what the problem was. Although my project started under the administration of George H.W. Bush, it was completed under the administration of William Jefferson Clinton. And as far as the Clinton administration was concerned, what I did was incredibly politically incorrect. The environmental movement, its myths, the EPA, you see, were sacrosanct, are sacrosanct, and not open to question. What they didn't count on, of course, was that I don't particularly care for authority, authoritarians, or their organizations. So I said goodbye to my lucrative career as a Beltway Bandit, took my report, and published it with my own money. I pitched it to the Wall Street Journal, which covered it in a lead editorial in December 1994, and that launched me on my career as the bete noir of the environmental movement. Now, I've related the story not because what I'm about to tell you about sustainability comes from a textbook or Wikipedia or years of blogging in my pajamas, but it comes from a career's worth of trench warfare, hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, with the EPA, the environmental movement, and even their industry victims and abettors. So let's talk about sustainability. What is it? Its basic conceit is that we only have one Earth, which is true. And if we use it up or pollute it beyond recognition today, there will be no Earth left to use or pollute tomorrow. But of course, we can't use the Earth up tomorrow either, since we'll need it the day after. But since we need to use and pollute at least part of the Earth and make it, to make it through today and tomorrow and into the, the day after, we need to figure out a way to ration our use of the Earth so we don't use it up, pollute it all at once. This rationing of the Earth's resources is sustainability. Now, while the theory of sustainability appears to have a great deal of intuitive appeal, the reality of sustainability is actually quite different. In all the years that I've worked on environmental issues, I've only run across one example where the concept of sustainability was actually test-driven. At least, it, it almost was. In the mid-2000s, I managed a publicly traded mutual fund called the Free Enterprise Action Fund. Taking a page from the environmental activist book, we bought shares in companies that were either being assaulted by radical environmentalists or had already been captured by them. One of these companies was the investment bank of Goldman Sachs. In 2005, we discovered that Goldman Sachs had used about $60 million of shareholder money to purchase 800,000 acre, 800, acres of land at the bottom of the world in Tierra del Fuego, and had, had then donated the land to a green group called the Wildlife Conservation Society. We took our complaint to the Goldman shareholder meeting, 
which happened to be the last shareholder meeting for then Goldman CEO Hank Paulson, a fearsome Wall Street personality who went on to become George W. Bush's Treasury Secretary. We proceeded to turn what Paulson had expected would be a 10-minute farewell shareholder meeting where he'd be applauded for another quarter of record earnings. We turned it into a one-hour nightmare, in which we accused him of using shareholder money for his own personal agenda. Paulson, you see, was not only the CEO of Goldman Sachs, he was also the chairman of the Nature Conservancy. Paulson's son was a trustee of the Wildlife Conservation Society, the group that picked up the 800,000 acres in Tierra del Fuego. But that bit of corruption was only the tip of the iceberg. In time, we came to learn the whole sordid history of this particular tract of land and its nightmarish intersection with sustainability. The land had originally been purchased by a Washington State timber company called Trillium. The CEO of Trillium, a guy named William Syrie, turned out to be rather green for a timber company CEO. He had actually purchased the 800,000 acres um, nine years before Goldman had donated in order to save it from a Japanese purchaser who wanted to clear cut the land and sell the wood. So Trillium outbid the Japanese, bought the land for $200 million, and announced that, he, that it intended to do the world's first sustainable logging project on the 800,000 acres. Trillium hired respected foresters to develop a sustainable logging plan that was hailed by um, conservationists as visionary. And conservationists are distinct from environmentalists. In short, Trillium said it would harvest only a very small portion of the trees every year and put some parts of the tract permanently off limits to logging. But here's where Trillium made its fatal mistake. Trillium invited the environmental community to bless its plan and invited the Greens to help implement it as well. In particular, Trillium began working with the Nature Conservancy, which at the time had a board member named Wendy Paulson, Hank Paulson's wife. While the Nature Conservancy pretended to help Trillium with its groundbreaking sustainability project, the rest of the environmental movement, about 200 groups, formed a global alliance determined to stop Trillium. Lawsuits were filed. Eventually, Trillium persevered, um, you know, meanwhile, hoping that the Nature, Nature Conservancy was actually helping it. The lawsuits went on for nine years. And yes, in the end, Trillium emerged uh, victorious from the litigation, but it was a Pyrrhic victory. The nine years, lost revenues, litigation expenses had weakened Trillium to the point where it wound up in bankruptcy court, where the notes securing the land were to be auctioned off. Although Trillium was able to raise enough money to outbid everyone else that appeared to be interested in the notes, at the last minute, Hank Paulson and Goldman Sachs came in, outbid Trillium, and acquired the land. Now, at this point, you might think that a savvy financial powerhouse like Goldman Sachs would take these 800,000 acres of forest, a multi-billion dollar asset, and log it for itself. Instead, the Hank Paulson at Goldman Sachs gave the land worth billions of dollars to the Wildlife Conservation Society and took only a $34 million tax deduction. When we brought this to the attention of Goldman Sachs at the shareholder meeting, Goldman's board of directors essentially fined Paulson $100 million. But the dirty deed, the sabotage of Trillium's plans for a sustainable forestry project, was not unwound. That was seven years ago. Today, the 800,000 acres in Tierra del Fuego remains unproductive. Trillium had anticipated revenues of $150 million annually from its sustainable forestry project. Instead, the Wildlife Conservation Society is now trying to figure out how to develop it into a site for ecotourism, which is pure foolishness as Tierra del Fuego is a cold, windy, remote part of the world. Now the sad tale is the reality of sustainability. It's only a notion, the purpose of which is to fool people into thinking that environmentalists exist on some higher moral plane than the rest of us. It's the environmentalists that are thinking of and planning for the future. Otherwise, the rest of us greedy earth user-uppers would just wreck the planet for future generations. In reality, sustainability is a con. It's a fraud. There's no there there. The real essence of sustainability is denial. It's saying no, no, you can't cut trees down. No, you can't use fossil fuels. No, you can't use water. You're not even supposed to be. When I started working as a consultant in 1990, one of the huge environmental controversies was trash. Consumption and its attendant waste disposal was not sustainable because the environmentalists said we were running out of landfill space. 20 years later, however, we have more people buying more stuff, creating more waste than ever, even with all the recycling that goes on. Even though we are throwing away about three times more trash than we did 20 years ago, 
Amazingly, or not, we have a huge surplus of landfill space, which is why it costs so little to have your trash picked up and disposed. Now, giving our reality-challenged environmentalist friends the benefit of the doubt that they were truly concerned about an impending scarcity of landfill space, we can only conclude that they made the same mistake the British demographer Thomas Malthus made in the late 18th century. Malthus projected that population growth would outstrip food production and that ensuing famine and starvation would cut population back down to size. What Malthus failed to foresee was the development of scientific knowledge and technology that would greatly expand the food supply so that never-ending surpluses of food are actually what had happened, not famine and starvation. Now, the next, we're going to jump forward in the, in the uh, timeline of Malthusians um, to, to the woman who is credited with launching the modern environmental movement, Rachel Carson. Carson warned that the continuing use of chemical pesticides, especially DDT, would decimate bird populations. This, of course, never happened. In fact, the great bird populations that Carson said were being threatened by pesticides like DDT were actually on the rebound when DDT use was at its highest. The bald eagle was not on the verge of extinction in 1960. It was on the verge of extinction in 1916 when it was nearly hunted into oblivion. DDT had nothing to do uh, with the fate of any of the great birds. <clears throat> um, nevertheless, DDT was banned by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 1972. It's a ban that was exported worldwide. And since then, tens of millions of poor people have died from malaria around the world, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. After Rachel Carson, the next great sustainability scaremonger was Paul Ehrlich, who published The Population Bomb in 1967. Like Malthus, Ehrlich predicted that hundreds of millions would perish from famine and starvation. To avoid this, he advocated, among other things, that the government spike drinking water with contraceptives. He fretted that fossil use was unsustainable because of heat trapping carbon, dis carbon dioxide. Uh, Paul Ehrlich was actually Al Gore before Al Gore was Al Gore. But Ehrlich turned out to be wrong, including about global warming. But that is a topic uh, for another discussion. Even though Ehrlich's population of global warming fear-mongering was entirely wrong, and because environmentalists are so totally beyond shame, he went on to bet Julian Simon in 1980 that the prices of five metals, tin, nickel, tungsten, copper, and chromium, would be, scar would be scarcer and, and cost more in 1990 than 1980. Simon won the bet handily as the availability of each metal increased during that 10-year period. And you may be interested in knowing that, for, just for grins, President Obama's current top science advisor, John Holdren, helped Ehrlich pick the metals to bet on. <laughs> Simon tried to get a second bet going with Ehrlich, but Ehrlich wisely chickened out. So let's talk about some other sustainability myths and realities. We hear from environmentalists that fossil fuel use is not sustainable. If they're not complaining about air pollution, then it's global warming, or that we'll simply run out of fossil fuels. The air quality reality, however, is that we burn more fossil fuels than ever, and our air, and I'm talking about China, I'm talking about U.S. air, the vast majority of the time is as clean and safe as it was before the pollution. I don't really want to talk about global warming because that is a separate discussion worth hours and hours. But suffice it to say that over the past 17 years, we've emitted more than 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have gone up 7 to 8 percent. And everyone agrees there's been no meaningful change in global temperature during that period. And we know from atmospheric physics that the next 500 billion tons of CO2 emitted will have less atmospheric impact than the previous 500 billion tons. So we've dispensed with air pollution and global warming. Are we running out of fossil fuels? Well, the answer is an emphatic no. Even without considering the new fracking technologies, other technologies making it possible to recover more oil from known and even previously tapped out formations. Humanity has so far used about a trillion or so barrels of oil, but just recently, at least 200 billion barrels of oil was discovered in the Australian outback. That find itself may actually hold a, a trillion barrels of oil. Now, if we bring in hydraulic fracturing, or fracking as the environmentalists like to call it, 
Um, fracking has been an energy game changer. In the last five or six years, the U.S. has gone from a net natural gas importer to having uh, enough natural gas to export. We have so much natural gas, the glut is so severe, the prices are so low, that it actually endangers the viability of the U.S. coal industry, which has several hundred years of reserves itself. The New York Times recently reported on a shale formation in the western U.S. called the Green River Formation. It has been estimated to hold three trillion barrels of reserves, more than all the known reserves in the world. Now, I'm not saying we're going back to 50 cents per gallon gasoline, which is was when I started driving. Um, global demand is growing, especially in India and China, but we aren't running out of fossil fuels either. What about water? Well, this shouldn't be news to anyone. Water is the most abundant substance on the planet. Now, there may be occasional droughts, reduced snow melts, and other natural and man-made shortages of water, but there's no way we're running out of water. We may need to figure out how to get water from where it is to where it needs to be, but there is plenty of water. We may have to import water from Canada, which holds 20% of the world's fresh water. We may have to desalinate seawater. We may have to rethink how we do stormwater management. Worst case, we may have to say goodbye to minor species of fish uh, freshwater fish that no one really cares about to start with, and uh, right now in, in California at the, uh, in San Joaquin Valley, um, farmers are fighting to get water. Uh, California, the federal government doesn't want to give them water because it's endangering this little fish called the snail darter. So we may wind up paying slightly more for water, but rest assured there is plenty of water. The only question that remains is whether the environmentalists will allow us to access it. That is the sustainability problem. Let's talk about population sustainability. There are two aspects of this question. First, while environmentalists assert a love for the planet, people take a decidedly back seat. Tens of, million, tens of millions of sub-Saharan Africans and others have died, and billions have been sickened from malaria since the sustainability movement labeled insecticides as unsustainable. Eight million children die annually from vitamin A deficiency. Now that we have developed uh, through biotechnology vitamin A-enriched golden rice, Many of these lives might be saved. Yet the Green Movement stands in lockstep against golden rice because biotechnology, by their decree, is not sustainable. But it might be sustainable for those poor, poor children, or at least some of them, who are dying from vitamin A deficiency. You know, the number one killer in the world is poverty, especially where it prevents people from clean water, sanitary living conditions, and electricity. But around the globe, efforts to improve basic living standards among the poorest people are routinely blocked by environmentalists. Our green friends worry about, say they worry about global warming causing flooding in Bangladesh, but not because they're genuinely interested in preventing the disaster, but so they can use the notion of flooding as a tragedy to advance their political cause in the U.S. Paul Ehrlich, our green demigod, population control demigod, is still a member of Stanford University and a member of the prestigious National Academy of Sciences. He said in the population bomb that the ideal global population, population is around one to two billion. And that was 45 years ago when the population was already double his ideal level. Who's going to step off the planet? Ehrlich's problem, and that of the sustainability movement, is that they view people as burdens on the planet. The rest of us know from experience that Paul Ehrlich is dead wrong, and that people are blessings and resources. Now, the second aspect of the population sustainability issue is actually the, the real sustainability, it's actually the real sustainability problem that sustainability advocates have entirely overlooked. And that problem is the sustainability of the welfare state. In the 1940s, about 40 workers supported each Social, each Social Security retiree. Today, it's less than three workers. And the, in the interim, not only have we jacked up Social Security wages, we've also added other entitlements like Medicare and now Obamacare. Meanwhile, our sustainability friends have been pushing birth control and abortion. Now, far be it for a libertarian like me to tell people how to manage their reprodu personal reproductive activities. But I would suggest to you that the welfare state will be unsustainable if we continue the war against reproduction. Finally, let's talk about the sustainability movement on college campuses. College campuses are obviously the perfect breeding grounds for environmentalism and sustainability. You've got kids who have spent 12 years in secondary school learning nothing. Most of what they've learned about the environment is, it amounts to little more than political correctness. And as we all know, universities are stocked with left-leaning academics to start with. Um, add to this the fact that the academics who do research on environmental issues more than likely get grant money from the pro-sustainability federal government. So kids that come into college not knowing anything about the environment are not likely to graduate knowing anything either. 
possibly worse than not learning anything is that environmental topics in college are taught dogmatically. Pesticides and fossil fuels are dangerous. Their use must be minimized if not eliminated. Natural resources are scarce. We must minimize their use. Sticking a shovel in the ground destroys the local ecosystem, so no development is allowed. What's not taught is any sort of critical thinking. The way I learned about environmental issues is by asking questions. Say I'd read somewhere that a certain chemical or pesticide was a cancer risk. <clears throat> I would then ask the question, well, how do you know that? I subsequently learned, much to my chagrin, that the person or organization making uh, the assertion really didn't know whether the chemical was a problem or not. So you've got intellectually vulnerable young adults spending four years on academically corrupt campuses, and then that bad combination is exploited by outside agitation from radical environmental groups. For example, the hot green issue right now is the Keystone XL pipeline, which if approved by the Obama administration would bring tar sands oil from the Canadian province of Alberta down to the Gulf Coast for refining and exporting. The environmental movement is simply apoplectic about Keystone XL. The tar sands give Canada the potential to become another Saudi Arabia. And since the Greens hate fossil fuels, the Canadian tar sands are the last thing they want to see commercialized. But because most people are for the pipeline, because we want its economic benefits, the environmentalists have been forced to rely on really their last line of defense, the college green movement for street theater against the Keystone XL. A Middlebury, a Middlebury College professor whose who's radical activist group 350.org is, is, is funded by fluorescent green private foundations and other fossil fuel haters, and he started a fossil fuel div divestment movement on the campus. Uh, just last week in Washington, D.C., they held what they consider the largest, uh, what they cl claim to be the largest global warming rally in history. Um, Back on the campuses, though, 350.org is organizing college kids across the country to petition, protest, and otherwise pressure their universities to divest fossil fuel uh, investments from their endowments. They are trying to equate fossil fuels with apartheid and even now slavery. Well, you laugh, but it's true. <laughs> now, because no talk about the environment is complete without a swipe at Al Gore, I think I already had one, but, you know, I have an extra one. Uh, consider that several weeks ago at a divestment rally at Harvard University, Al Gore told the students that if, if he was young, he'd be agitating for a divestment along with them. Now, the irony lost on the naive and gullible and even dopey college kids is that just a week or so earlier, Al Gore had announced that he was selling his current TV to Qatar-owned Al Jazeera for $500 million, a sum earned from the production of oil. What is to be done about mindless and radical environmentalism and sustainability on the college campus? Is it even important as young adults turn into adult adults, will they simply grow up? Will they move on from youthful dalliances with this flagrant nonsense? While I'm not in the business of predicting the future, I will say that it may be useful to look at the baby boomer experience. Did the college radicals of the 1960s grow up? Some did, but many didn't. Worse, the ones that didn't now run the country. So the intellectual, of college, the intellectual corruption of college campuses does have consequences. Now, strange as it may seem, I don't really blame colleges for this travesty. It's our fault. We have allowed this to happen. Now, at the risk of overgeneralizing, you know, we can safely divide the political spectrum into, to the left and right. While folks on the right spend 40 or more hours per week creating wealth, the other side is spending 40 or more hours per week plotting how to redistribute it. That is their profession. They want to manage and ration society, and they do it on a full-time basis. <clears throat> you know, since the beginning of the progressive movement, the left has spent its time infiltrating and ultimately capturing institutions like universities. By now, the left has captured virtually every major societal institution, including most large publicly traded corporations. And we have let it happen because we've been too busy creating the wealth that they want to redistribute. So what can we do about this? Well, I can name probably 10 or 15 others who, like me, fight the environmental and sustainability movement on a full-time basis. But we few are up against dozens of major environmental organizations, each with scores of staff and billions of dollars in funding, all working to, make, to remake society <clears throat> as they see it. Now, if I was a Malthusian, I would say that we're all doomed. The Greens are strangling our economy. They're strangling our society. 
It appears that all is nearly lost, especially after last November. But I'm not a Malthusian. Uh, previously unforeseen technology has helped us avert one disaster already. My fellow global warming skeptics and I have so far frustrated the Greens from capturing control of the economy through carbon emissions regulation. We could not have done it without the internet, which like the printing press did 500 years ago, ended controlled distribution of news and information. Now, since I don't know how much longer this small band of skeptics can continue to struggle alone <laughs> you know, against this huge green movement, we are, you know, we are getting older and the battle does get wearisome, I encourage all of you to get involved in whatever way you can. Nothing you can do is inconsequential, even if it's just a simple letter to the editor. I urge you to be confident about this issue. The sustainability movement is not about making sure there's enough earth left for people to live on in the future. It's not about saving the polar bears. It's about totalitarian style control of every aspect of our lives. These, these people want to tell you where to work, where to live, uh, <laughs> whether to live, um, you know, how much water you can have, how much electricity, um, how mu what kind of food you should eat, just every aspect of your lives. I mean, we already have, you know, green approved toilets. Uh, we're implementing green approved light bulbs. Just a couple years ago in California, the Greens tried to ban the sale of dark colored cars. Okay, so you couldn't even have the color car you wanted. Um, I mean, it, it really is every aspect of your life. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that the United Nations has a sustainability uh, program called Agenda 21. As its, as its name sounds, it's a plan for uh, global management for the 21st century. I wish I had a PowerPoint so I could show you the picture. But when you go home today, I want you to Google Agenda 21 map. You'll get a mostly yellow, orange, and red map of the U.S. that lays, how, lays out how the U.N. Agenda 21 plan would restrict private property and development in the U.S. It's a shocking image because it's all yellow, orange, and red, except for uh, a little bit of green, which is the allowable spaces for humanity on the East Coast and maybe around Los Angeles. Yeah, na now, for, you know, for a natural-born anti-authoritarian like me, opposing this sort of control of my life is a no-brainer. But when I learned that it was based on a whole pack of lies to start with, I understandably became incensed. And I urge you to become incensed, too. Thank you. We have time for questions. Held microphone, so if you want to ask a question, raise a hand. Someone will find his way to you. Anybody, any question? Yes, uh, concerning Tierra del Fuego. Where are you? Here. Where? Concerning oh. Tierra del Fuego. As I recall from my visit down there many years ago, that belongs to Argentina, right? Belongs to Argentina. Uh, it's it's uh, the 800,000 acres was uh, part uh, Chile, part Argentina. Part, well, all right, Chile and Argentina. Aren't they players in this? Are they happily uh, accepting the fact that you, you've uh, locked away uh, that uh, very large piece of real estate that could be converted into wealth? Yeah, you know, they are remarkably unprepared <clears throat> to deal with the sustainability movement. As a matter of fact, the guy, I believe it's the guy that started North Face, uh, he, has, he has bought enough land. He has almost uh, bisected Chile with his land holdings, and I believe there's some ongoing litigation about this. Um, all this stuff, uh, you know, I, I think those societies are probably sufficiently corrupt where, you know, you can make things go away with money, and money goes a long way, and... Uh, you know, they don't really have the strong sort of, um, you know, free enterprise movement we have here in the watchdog system. So, <clears throat> no, I, I think those countries have been asleep at the switch. Perfect. You need the... Um... There's a lot of literature on the other side. Julian Simon published The Ultimate Resource. Herman Kahn wrote Globaloni. I mean, there are were, there were literally dozens of books representing a position consistent with yours. Why aren't they assigned? Well, you know, Herb, that's a great point. Um, and I have a very dear friend who's a physician in Texas, and we talk about this all the time. He's extremely well-read, knows everything there is to know about everything. Um, and the, but that's the problem with folks on the right. Um, you know, we know what's wrong, but 
you know, we're too busy doing other things and we don't prioritize actually taking action. Whereas the other side, they don't spend any time learning about anything. They just act. And it really does work. Would you comment uh, about our glorious mayor and uh, his, his, his agenda which, and, and the fact that many conservatives, particularly conservatives with money, like very much? Yeah. And second, what is he likely to do with his foundation when he leaves office? On this front, well, you know, I would, I would, I would say, for the most part, um, you know, Michael Bloomberg is, you know, New York City's personal tragedy, um, and I would kind of limit, you know, his. I think he's way off base with, you know, his nannying on salt, trans fats, you know, the uh, uh, going after 16 ounce sodas. I mean, this is crazy, but this is New York City's problem for right now. Now, the pro the real problem I have with Bloomberg is that. For example, he has given the Sierra Club $50 million, and they are using that money um, to go around shutting down coal-fired power plants, and <laughs> you know, which is making us more dependent on natural gas, which you know, right now it's cheap, uh, but natural gas has a very spiky history. You never know what's going to happen with natural gas. Uh, so, yeah, Bloomberg is, is a problem on the uh, national level because of his foundation. I mean, he will use his money. He is very anti-coal. Last week in Washington, D.C., he gave a speech where he said, uh, you know, coal is, is dead man walking. Coal provides 35 percent, 40 percent of our electricity. And for him, just, you know, based on junk science to go after coal is ridiculous. But, you know, when you have a lot of money, like George Soros, you can do whatever you want. wondering what uh, role large corporations play in this debate. Do you find them yeah. um, to be helping you, or are they just kind of pandering? Uh, to two is a great question. When I started out, um, large corporations uh, would be interested in supporting people like me. I mean, they were interested in science, si sound science, sound economics, uh, but that is no longer the case. I mean, they have been um, hijacked by Greens, you know, you have the chairman of the Nature Conservancy, chairman of Goldman Sachs. It makes a big difference. Uh, even, even companies which um, don't sign on really to the green agenda, uh, like the oil companies, um, they have frankly been intimidated from, you know, taking too high a profile uh, on these issues. And it's, it's really unfortunate because, um, you know, they're in the right, the green is in the wrong, it's easy to demonstrate. It's just that they're, you know, corporate America, uh, they're either squeamish or they've been taken over. I mean, it's another, this is why we, I started this mutual fund in the mid-2000s was to push back on this. Um, and, you know, you wind up meeting a lot of CEOs and talk with them, you really find out that there's just a lot of, you know, if they're not empty suits on environmental issues, then, you know, they are like green plants. <laughs> And, um, you know, it's a real problem for America. Could you um, just give us a very simple distinction, usable for students, uh, between weather and climate? Well, weather is what's happening out right now. Climate is a longer term uh, atmospheric condition. Uh, you know, we hear the term climate change and uh, I think it's really misused. Um, you know, climate is always changing. However, it's changing, it uh, generally changes very slowly. So you can hardly notice it. Um, you know, people are, ca are calling what's going on right now climate change. Well, there is some climate change, but I don't know that we can really detect any significant climate change. Um, you know, 30 years ago, uh, the environmentalists were panicking about global cooling. Okay. Uh, then it became global warming. And when that stopped panning out, it became climate change. Um, I think they've started to realize the silliness of that. Uh, and, and now things are speeding up. Uh, last year was extreme weather, you know, Hurricane Sandy and everything else. Um, and, and now I'm picking up that extreme weather is not where they want to go. They want to go with climate disruption. <laughs> so, you know, not that that has any uh, basis, but of course, we're going to have to spend a couple years debunking climate disruption, whatever, you know, whatever that means. So. Um, yes, yeah, so basically, you know, weather is short-term, climate is very long-term. Over here. 
Uh, whoever has the microphone, they, they got the floor. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, 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 and I think most of the people around um, respond well to almost everything, I think. The only, one question is with respect to population. What if we do a little cost-benefit analysis here and we say to ourselves, okay, so let's say, uh, why shouldn't we want um, half the population uh, that we currently have in 10, 20, 30 years? Where's the downside? It seems to me the only downside that you pointed to uh, is that uh, we won't be able to afford to continue with Social Security and uh, Medicare. And if that's the case, eventually a price is going to have to be paid. We can't continue to increase the population in order to support uh, uh, Medi Medicare uh, and Social Security. So why shouldn't we struggle to try to limit population to some extent and avoid some of the problems? And you admit that there are some environmental problems that come with population. Well, I, I abhor central planning. I think central planning is a failure. So population control as a matter of central planning, it just makes me, you know, uh, um, you know, there's, there's a natural effect when as societies get wealthier, uh, they have fewer children. You know, you don't need to have 10 children uh, with the knowledge that, you know, only three of them are gonna survive. Uh, you can just have three children, and the odds are pretty good that all three are gonna grow up and, and um, you know, do well. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not for having more people to support Social Security and the welfare state. That's not me. I'm just saying that you know, that's the liberal sort of hypocrisy or, you know, sustainability problem. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't think we should be saying who can be born or who can't be born or how many people there should be. Uh, I think that this is a big planet and there is lots of resources as long as we have the ability to use them the wealthier societies become, the cleaner, the healthier they become. We should be, uh, if there is going to be a central planning policy, it should be encouraging economic development so that people can become wealthier. I mean, when you become wealthier, you become cleaner. I mean, just look at the United States and, and the Western uh, and, and Europe compared with Russia and, and China and Brazil and Mexico. You know, environmental ho horrors where, you know, they're, they live in dirty environments because they're poor. Look at the air pollution going on in China right now. It's because even with all the Chinese uh, economic growth, they still don't feel that they afford the basic controls uh, on their smokestacks. And so the answer there is, you know, not necessarily to make Chinese pass a Clean Air Act because that's kind of obvious, um, but you know, it's for China to become even more economically successful so that they feel like, yeah, you know, we, we can afford to clean up the air. I hope that answered your question. Um, thank you. Uh, can you comment on the, the recent narrative that if uh, Congress doesn't pass any action regarding environmental stuff, that the president will do some kind of executive order action on this? Uh, well, he doesn't really need executive orders, per se, uh, but he's got the Environmental Protection Agency, and thanks to, uh, you know, Justice Anthony Kennedy, uh, who granted the EPA the authority to regulate carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act, um, the EPA kind of has carte blanche to do what it wants. And the reason I say carte blanche is because it's very difficult to sue and, and beat EPA in court because... Um, the laws have been constructed, you know, first off, these laws were all written by environmentalists, and they were written by environmentalists to be enforced by environmentalists. Um, they were not written, you know, contrary to the image of industry lobbyists out there, you know, getting these laws just the way they want them, um, that hasn't happened in the environmental field. Um, industry tends to be victims of these laws. They cannot defend them, so they cannot, de you know, <clears throat> the only way you can beat EPA in a federal court is if you find some egregious procedural error. You cannot question EPA science. You cannot question EPA economics. You cannot question EPA decision making. All you can do is hope to find that they tripped someplace. Um, so President Obama can do a lot through the EPA. Right now, you know, he, in his last administration, he essentially proposed to ban new coal-fired power plants. Um, in this administration, he is expected uh, to set standards for existing coal-fired power plants that will drive them out of uh, existence. Um, I, you know, and I think, you know, and, and so people think, well, you know, President Obama is for, you know, fracking and natural gas. 
And it, in my view, he is only using natural gas because he's using natural gas to destroy the coal industry. Uh, natural gas prices, you know, there's a glut of natural gas. Um, and he likes the glut because his glut has reduced prices so much um, that you know, coal, which is really pretty cheap fuel, can't really compete with it in the U.S. anymore. And so utilities are starting to plan for a non-coal future relying on this continued glut. But I can assure you that um, you know, President Obama and possibly a President Hillary uh, after that, uh, once, once coal is killed, they are going to kill fracking, okay? And then what are we going to do? Now, if you, you know, um, in, in my book, Green Hell, I describe how uh, the environmentalists, you know, they don't like fossil fuels. They don't like nuclear power. You know, they don't really like solar and wind either. Um, wherever they can, they block these things. Senator Dianne Feinstein from California, she had a couple years ago, she had a bill to block solar panels in the uh, California desert, worried about, you know, how they might interfere with the uh, desert tortoise. Uh, offshore wind farms, um, you know, you've got to do these environmental impact statements uh, that, that focus on how, how the wind turbine pylons might interfere with um, the reproductive habits of whales. It, you know, it's just, it's crazy. Uh, but to answer your question, you know, o President Obama has a lot of executive authority uh, and with a split Congress, um, you know, the only tool the, co the Republicans have is to say no. Um, in, in the last four years, um, you know, they passed a lot of bills uh, to try to rein in the EPA and President Obama, uh, but you know, those things never had a chance in the Senate, and they seem reluctant to me to use their budgetary power. I mean, they could just say no. They could cut back funding for EPA, but they haven't been willing to do that so far. Are we on, I have to keep us on schedule, my unhappy duty.